and do do do. Like us on captions. Okay, we are good to go. Well, welcome everybody to our lunch hour session on the power of psychology. Um, this has been a few months of work trying to um, get this scheduled, bring this to you. I had reached out to Jen a while ago about doing this, so we're so glad she could join us today. Um, I'm Dr. Alicia Shadowman from the Center for Nonprofit and NGO Studies. Um, I'll give a little bit of an introduction about the center, and then we'll hear from Dr. Shang and her presentation. At the end of her presentation, I'll show the student codes. So for those of you who are coming from Business Passport or Honors, I'll show those QR codes and put the links in the chat. Um, if you have to drop off for any reason and you miss those, just uh, shoot me an email and I can approve those through the websites as well. We do get a transcript of everyone who was online and when they joined us. So the Center for Nonprofit NGO Studies here at NIU, um, we're located in Zuloff Hall. We have an undergraduate major, minor and certificate. We also have a new undergraduate certificate in grant writing. Um, we do a number of internships locally and regionally, paid and unpaid. So if you're a student and want to do a nonprofit internship, please reach out to us. We do a lot of hands-on experiences, and we also do a number of networking events. We have one coming up in the spring that I'll mention to you. You can find us online on um, the web as well as in social media. Um, I would say Instagram is usually where students follow us. It's our grad students actually take over our Instagram most of the time. So you can always check us out there. On campus, if you're a student here, you can. Um, we also run the Husky Closet. It's a free clothing closet in the field house. Um, the food pantry is at one end and the clothing closet is at the other. You can donate, either drop stuff off here to the center or during the open hours, Wednesdays and Thursdays. And you could also volunteer. So if you know, have a club and you're interested in doing that, you know, please reach out to us and we can make that happen. Um, I reached out to Dr. Shang a while ago to let her know I might be in in England this summer. So um, I'm part of an NIU at Oxford program that's coming up the last week of June and, the, and um, all of July. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out to the study abroad office um, and find out more information about that. There are three courses being offered that you can pick from. Um, I'll be doing a course on the settlement house movement, which started in London. And then I'll be talking specifically about the evolution in Chicago. Um, if you are interested in doing internships, we have an information session coming up March 8th um, in the evening in DeSable Hall, where most of our classes are taught. Just information about what's expected in a nonprofit internship. Um, we do have a course that you can take. You don't have to. We can also arrange for nonprofit internships during the summer. If you go home and you're like, I'd really like to do an internship over the summer, we can find you one because um, we have pretty good networks across Northern Illinois. One of our future programs um, is March 28th. Um, I'll be doing a, a lunchtime webinar, so a 12 to one with Dr. Christine Mooney. And we're gonna talk about all things earned revenue and social entrepreneurship. And this should be fun. Uh, Christine is in the business school. And so even around definitions, uh, we're gonna have a good time <laughs> because there's not a really set definition of what social enterprise or social entrepreneurship is, especially within the context of uh, nonprofits. So this should be a good, a good program. Okay, and our main event for today is Dr. Shang. Um, she's the world's first PhD in philanthropy and the world's only philanthropic psychologist, co-founder and co-director of the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy based in the UK. And you could find out more information about her from their website. So I will stop sharing right now, Dr. Shang, and you can take it away. Brilliant, thank you very much. I will start with the sharing of my screen. And then I'll put my panel view on. So if you'd like to switch on your video and show me your smiley faces, do feel free. <laughs> at the moment, I have only four smiley faces looking at me. I'd like to see more, please. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's very nice. Thank you very much for turning on your, your video. It's always nice to see smiley faces. All right, so today we're gonna have 45 minutes talking about the power of psychology and the research on fundraising strategy. And um, Alicia have kindly summarized the key takeaways from today right in um, the abstract of this presentation, which is we're gonna learn how to get a donor's attention, how to build trust, and how to build donor loyalty. 
these are exciting topics. I'm sure um, you are all interested in learning about it, especially if you have been working in the nonprofit world for a while, and especially if you are trying to build relationships with your donors in order to raise funds to fund your fabulous missions. So these are really important questions to ask. And we are addressing it um, from the perspective of psychology at the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy. Just five um, slides about what our institute is about if you have never encountered us before. Um, at our institute, we focus on the sustainability of, uh, of philanthropy. So it's not just encouraging people to give ones that we're interested in. We're interested in helping nurturing people into lifelong philanthropists so their philanthropic actions can be sustainable throughout their lifetime. We have five team members, researchers, um, and we believe giving should be transformative for donors and for the causes to which they give. So if you have been working in the nonprofit um, world already for a few years, you will know that many, 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 many nonprofits have a beautiful visions and beautiful missions that they want to achieve. And very often they attract donors for their mission. And that is something we are trying to change the nonprofit professionals' minds about, which is, you are not in the business of trying to find donors and then change their mind. <laughs> you with me? You're not in the business of trying to find donors and then change their mind. You're in the business of attracting donors who are interested in what you do. So you are attracting people who are already attracted to what you do. And once they come and raise their hand to say, I actually do like you do, you don't try to change their mind. You try to feel what they're interested in already. You try to deepen their understanding. You try to understand who they are so that you can plant what you do more and more deeply into their lives. So that's the kind of perspective we take when we talk about how nonprofits can think about fundraising. It's about raising money, but it's also raising fans and supporters for the mission and the vision that they already are interested in. We work with nonprofit professionals, trusted advisors, as well as philanthropists um, that they care for. Our mission is to grow the human capacity to love. And if you haven't come across it already, philanthropy in its Greek definition is literally the love for humankind. So this is not a deviation from what we do in the nonprofit sector. The philanthropic sector is defined by the love for humankind. And we'll talk more about the psychology of it. For over 30 years, we focused on giving by mass, giving by high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals, and we help nonprofit nonprofit professionals to overcome challenges in raising money. On our website, you can download all these research reports for free. By these reports show you how to create a more supportive organizational environment, how to create a more supportive societal environment in order to overcome challenges for fundraising. This research also tell you how to connect with high net worth individuals in the field of development, how they manage their risk, how they gain philanthropic literacy, how they achieve meaningful philanthropy in the 21st century. And finally, we have a program on mass giving. This is the bread and butter of our research. Over the years, I would say our research collective probably have data from over 2 million donors around the world, North America, Europe, Australia, Asia. And we have four reports alone on relationship fundraising, how you can thank you donors, how you can encourage gift in wills, how you can um, build great fundraising events, how you can um, build loyalty. So all of these reports are free. You can go to our website and download them and enjoy the learning from it. Today, we're gonna talk about how philanthropic psychology can empower your understanding of mass donors, 
high net worth individual donors and um, potentially overcome any challenges that you have experienced in your organization. Philanthropic psychology, as Alicia introduced, is something that um, I created. Um, I have no idea why in the year of 2020, we haven't got a philanthropic psychologist on the planet because it feels like the most obvious subject to study. Okay, so how do people love each other from the perspective of the, psychology, the, the science of psychology? Why haven't anybody done it? I have no idea. <laughs> But nobody has actually studied how people love people as a discipline. So I figured well, something to do for my life, that's fine. <laughs> uh, there are three key topics that philanthropic psychology studies. It includes the study of how we love ourselves and how we love other people. It study who is the person doing the lo loving, not just the act of loving. And also, who is being loved? We're going to talk about all of this with a lot of examples coming up. And then finally, what does love really mean? And I have to tell you, like, from the research we do, we have come to realize that, you know what, love actually is a really, really complex um, subject to study in the field of philanthropy. So this year, we're actually commissioning, commissioning another um, large scale field study where we're going to explore the love language of fundraising. <laughs> so yes, watch the space. There's going to be some fun stuff coming out. But to start with, we're going to talk about the answer to your first question, which is how to get a donor's attention. Speak to their moral identity. I know we all do good stuff, I know our mission are all interesting, our vision are all fabulous. All that what I'm telling you today is if you want to grab attention for your vision, for your mission, for your brand, for your organization, you will need to be able to translate those things into people's sense of who they are. And the most important thing for most people that we studied who are donors to nonprofits, the most important thing for them is their moral identity. It's the sense of people being a kind and caring and helpful and compassionate person. That is the most important thing for them. How do we know that? Well, like I told you, we surveyed over 22 organizations database. In each database, we ask, what are the top five words that come to mind when you describe yourself as a person? Versus, what are the top five words that come to mind when you describe yourself as a supporter? And then guess what? Caring, kind, and compassionate are amongst the top 10 words people use to describe themselves as a person everywhere, anywhere. Like even if you have to translate from Italian or Spanish, it's still those words. <laughs> They're just spelled differently. <laughs> so, you know, being a moral person as being defined as a kind and caring and compassionate by these moral traits, it's real. Like this is how donors to charities describe themselves. Highest frequency words means these are the top in people's mind. Wherever they are, they carry these words, these traits about themselves around wisdom. That's why when you ask them for only five words, those are the words that show up. They are years, thousands of academic publications on the topic of more identity. But to actually see these words being used by thousands, actually hundreds of thousands now, real charity donors give us real confidence that actually what we do in the academy behind closed doors actually matter because that's how donors actually think about themselves. And that's what they express when they give to charities. So if you want to grab their attention, you appeal to their sense of being kind, caring, and compassionate. And I'll show you how to do this in about five slides time. But for now, just remember, if you want to get their attention, you speak to their moral identity. 
And if you want to build trust, which means you want them to take risks with you, give their money and trust that you will spend the money wisely and in the way that they would like you to, then you need to get to know about how special your donors' moral identities are because every organization's moral people are different. How do we know that? Well, again, we rely on data, right? No two organizations' database look like the same. More identities are always, always expressed in different ways, depending on which organization it is. So for example, for an animal organization, it can be straightforward, can, kind, caring, compassionate, loyal, helpful. And it doesn't matter whether it's people's self words or their supporter words, it's the same words. They're always the same. Their moral identity is based on these traits. But for other organizations like this one, Lifeboat Institute, in the US, uh, in, in, the, in the UK, these are volunteers who go out into sea rescue people when they're in trouble. How do they describe themselves? Well, <laughs> because they're caring, but they're also retired and old. And yes, they are friendly and happy, but yes, they are retired and old. Right, and that's how people use, use these words, to, that's how people describe themselves, that's how they feel about themselves. But look at the words they use when they describe themselves as a supporter. They're supportive, they're grateful, they're interested, they're helpful, they have admiration, they're proud, they're committed, they're happy. Did you notice something here? When people think about themselves, they're retired and old. Can you find those words on this side? You know, when people think about, you know, they're going out into the sea, rescue people in sub-degree, sub-zero degree storms. Suddenly it brought them out of their living room, their retired and old life into the excitement of saving lives in some of the most severe weather conditions. That meant something to them. That changed something in them that gives them, th them something in their lives that they can't otherwise have. So a real connection that people can experience with a charity that they love can make a difference in how they feel about themselves in addition to the good deed they do for others. So it's not to tell you not to emphasize your mission or your vision when you communicate with your donors, but to communicate it in a way that can help your people also materialize the difference that achieving those vision and mission can make in their own lives. Lyric Chicago, next door neighbor, caring, kind, intelligent, curious, appreciative, enthusiastic. You know, you can see the words change depending on what people are thinking about. And you can see the the composition of people differ depending on the organization. So how have organizations used them once they get to know their donors? Some of them use them in the most creative and beautiful ways, but fundamentally, they use this knowledge to do two things. One, they use it to grow giving. We have organizations who have completed the, this research about three years, almost four years ago now, and they have since doubled their giving. Not once, not twice. The most successful organization now almost doubled three times. By applying this research day in and day out through all the channels that they've got, consistently over time. So this is not just some fundraising strategy or technique you can deploy today and think you're gonna get some money and then it's gonna disappear next day. This is not that kind of technique. When you raise money in this way and you create growth, it's sustainable growth. Because the way you are growing money is by growing people's inherent sense of being kind and caring people. So the more they give, the more kind and caring they become, and the more they want to give. 
So it's a sustainably replenishable kind of way of growing giving. So how do people do it? Just a few examples here. And all of these examples are from organizations who have learned about philanthropic psychology, who have learned about who their donors are, and who have repeatedly applying them in various channels. So this is a channel, uh, this is an organization called um, Leprosy Mission. This is their branch in Australia. Their branch in Scotland, England, um, US, and um, a few other countries, all of them have employed a similar mentality. And they have employed this not only in their fundraising communications, but in their catalogs, in their volunteer programs, in their events, in their communication with churches, it's everywhere. But just as an example of attracting new donors through the usage of Christmas gift catalog, before they get to know their donors and focus on more identity, they tell Yaha's story. I feel sad that my friends don't play with me because I have leprosy. I feel lonely among other girls my age. And then they talk about key to, to products symbols and handmade um, products, handmade products, handmade products, gift of love, like all the things that people can buy in this catalog. But then look at what they say here. Your kindness can do something about these leprosy facts. So it's not like they are not talking about leprosy. And it's not that they are not talking about no child with leprosy by a certain year, they do. It's not like they are not talking about all the best products they can offer, they do. They have all of the, those elements, but they also have, what do all these cement to you who is a kind person? What can your kindness do? So they're not saying your gift can do this or buy something. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. My light just went out on me. I need to stand up and have a bit of motion so my life will come back. Um, it's the, the beauty of having a motion sensor lighting. Um, all right. So it's not, it's not not to talk about all the things that are important to the organization, but it's also very important to talk about how does people's kindness fit into everything else that you do um, for the people that you care for. Black Hills Works Foundation, beautiful way of communicating with their donors. When, when people choose to donate something, they don't get you know, one gift by a tent, two gifts by two pairs of shoes. They get, thank you for helping me. <laughs> Thanks for everything. Thank you for your kindness. It's like connections built in everything that people write. So when people give, they're not just giving. They can feel the love coming back at them before even they choose how much they want to give. I bet no matter which level that people click here, they would read through all the thank yous. <laughs> they will saturate in the goodness that this organization is giving them before they choose how much to give. And the beauty of it is they don't even need to give. They can still experience the goodness that this organization is giving them unconditionally. And that's how love can grow out of giving. That's why this approach is not going to deplete your donor's giving potential, but to grow them. Elephants need you to live their large and wild lives. And this is the beautiful sentence right next to it. Thank you for choosing to join our herd and protect the elephant lives. Your kindness today helps to secure their future. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Bridging the distance that people have with the elephants by thanking them for choosing to join our herd. I mean, how cute is that? It's just beautiful ways if we can begin to think about the donors in the context of our mission. Leaving a gift in your will, your kindness will create a world 
without leprosy. We can even introduce people to the idea of gift in wheels when we connect all the dots together based on who they are. This is my favorite. <laughs> Somebody uh, from our field site class graduated and she decided, I'm just gonna ask my people what words they use. <laughs> and she literally printed this words on a thank you card and sent it back to her donors. It's just beautiful. And it's just, they're just having so much fun like when they do fundraising this way. You know, fundraising is fun. It connects people. And this is uh, from the National Deaf Children's Society. This is a uh, give thanks and upgrade call. And as you can see in the control condition, they say, let me also um, say thank you so much for your very kind support. And note here, the word kind is used to describe the action support versus in this condition, yes, there is an act of kindness. I would like to thank you for your generosity, but then look at what they said, which has changed life, but also for being the kind of person who really cares. So they're not just thanking people for the actions. They're thanking people for the kind of person who really cares. So that thank you goes a bit deeper into people's hearts. 27% increase in this upgrade campaign. And Frizz has since raised 1.6 million pound additional because she cha he changed their welcome cycle consistently, repeatedly, every time after new donors are recruited, they thank them in this way. And within the last 12 months, I just asked um, our alumni how much more money they're raising. His is 1.6 million. That's the additional that they did, not just how much money they're raising, just by thanking people for being kind and caring and compassionate. So those are examples where you can see the growth in money and how people are doing it. The next two examples I'm going to show you give you a better sense of the love that people are also growing. And, and by the way, the, the organizations I'm showing you, their money are also growing sustainably. Um, USA for UNHCR, this is the USA um, charity set up to support the UN High Commission for the Refugees. So before they get to know their donors, their website looks like any other NGO's website. People are hungry in Yemen, that's the problem. Send urgently needed shelter protection and help today, and help and hope today, that's the solution. And there is the call to action, donate now. Problem, solution, donate now. Very standard donation page formula. After they've got to know their donors, what do they say? Keep families warm. Send life-saving winter supplies and aid to strong refugee families trying to make it through this bitter, cold winter. Are they talking about problems? Absolutely. They're refugees. They battle bitter, cold winter. But are they calling them people? No, they're calling them families. Why? Because when they talk to their donors, their donors use words like, I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, I'm a dad, to describe their sense of who they are. So they understand, actually, being a family member is really important to our people. So they no longer call the people they help people, but they call the families they help families. Is that true? Absolutely. They're helping families. Why don't you say it? Well, we just think need to think a little bit more and get some data, right? And thank you all of you for um, giving me your smiley faces and looking at me and staring at me at the screen. It's very helpful. Uh, makes me feel very good. Thank you. Um, so now this is my favorite word on this website. It says some life-saving winter supplies and aid to strong refugee families. Where do they come up with the word strong? Well, Strong 
is one of the highest frequency words that their donors used to describe who they are. And then they're thinking, are our refugees strong people? Are they strong? Uh, yeah, they survived eight years of conflict in Yemen, the parents, on a little bit of bread and tea once a day. And they give their food to their children for eight years. These people are strong people. Why don't we call them strong refugee families? They're strong refugee families. <laughs> so they put the words that they know are important to their donors to describe who the refugees are, actually. And in doing so, they're helping their donors to see themselves in the people they help. So they're no longer helping those refugees far away who are hungry. They're helping people just like them. Strong families. That's who they're giving money to. And that's the love they grow from this money. They raised 54% this Christmas over last month. And because it's not a B split um, test, I can't tell you, oh, because they use this word, they raise more money. They just raised 54% over their Christmas period. That's what happened. And they just so happened to use these words, right? And when it comes to the refugee day, when they talk about matching gifts, and we know like there's match and there's match and there's match and there's match and there's match everywhere. And there's a lot of research on match, but look at what they're matching. Double your impact, double your love, your kindness today will be matched to give even more hope for vulnerable families. So it's not just the money that's being matched, it's the impact, it's the love, it's the kindness, that's what's being matched and fueled around the world. Absolutely beautiful. If you explore the archives in um, the USA for UNHCR's communications, in their fundraising, you know, give their money, sign up, read their um, donor newsletters. Most beautiful, heartwarming storytelling. You can't lay your eyes on their newsletter for more than three paragraphs without seeing the donor and the refugee hand in hand, growing love together. It's just beautiful. Another example, warm appeals from um, British Columbia, RSPCA, BCS, PCA. So a lot of um, RSPCAs raise money by telling people, you know, like we get angry when people, when animals are abused, we get sad when animals suffering. There's a lot of negativities associated with animal abuse. And very often animals are portrayed as the voiceless creatures that somehow humans help. But look at the kind of love that is being grown in this community with BCS PCA. And this is um, a warm appeal sent to existing donors to raise more money towards the end of COVID. Can you believe it has been 12 months since the COVID lockdown? Thank goodness for our pets providing essential comfort since forever. So they don't think about animals as creatures humans give to. They think about animals as those who give humans more than humans can ever give back to them. Why do they do that? Because in their donor survey, that's how their donors express their love to their animals. They don't see themselves as the protector of the animals. They see themselves as beneficiaries. They see themselves as the recipients of the animal's unconditional love to them. So they say, I can never do as much for animals as what animals can do for me. So that's their love. So that's how they changed the way they talk to their donors about love. It's not about, oh, you know, I hate these people and hate those people. It's about, we can't possibly love more than animals love us. And it's 
just beautiful. Like if you if you follow this through, this is the headline of a direct mail pack. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it's like an envelope with four pieces of paper. And this is the first thing that people see. And um, at the end of the letter, in um, after some storytelling, what people see at the end in the PS is looking back, what I will remember most about this past year is that your compassion brought essential comfort to animals and their humans. <laughs> so what the fundraising letter did between the headline and the PS is to connect the comfort that animals give to humans, gradually transitioning to asking, but their animals were still suffering. They still need you to help them. So can you offer them the comfort, but not in a sentimental, judgmental, guilt people way. The letter is so well crafted. The love between human and animals is just being felt to be genuine. So when people come here, when they are gonna give money, when they're gonna use their compassion to bring essential comfort to the animals, it feels like it's a natural flow back and forth, ebb and flow between the animals and themselves. And it's just beautiful to see how this kind of love can be built through fundraising communications. And for this particular BCSPCA, they have tracked how competent, autonomous, and connected. Those are fundamental psychological well-being that people experience out of giving three years, um, three years ago, and then they measured it again three years later. What they found after they communicate with their donors in this way, and they did get money, but more than money they found for every dollar that people say they intend to give, they experience three times more psychological well-being. That's why this gift will be sustainable. It's because for every dollar people give, they feel better about that giving. And this year, we're going to have our signature project discovering even more of this love language. I've showed you two love language that is being spoken in the refugee situation and in RSPCA. Why do we feel like we need to understand more about the love language? Because actually, we studied four RSPCAs around the world. They're all RSPCAs, but every database love language is different. I showed you one love language. There's another love language in a different RSPCA where people give because their, heart, because their hearts ache for the animals. So it's that aching that make them angry and make them sad. So they're going to connect to that aching of people's heart for the animals. For another RSPCA, it's not about animals at all. People connect to animal rescuers, those brave and courageous humans who can face animal suffering in ways that donors can never face themselves. They support those heroes. And finally, for the last animal organization, people are giving because they feel the, the future and the hope in humanity by connecting with other animal lovers just like them. So we studied four animal charities, only two of them, the love is with animals. The other two, the love is with humans. How could people find this out without doing research? I have no idea. I had not anticipated before we started data collection. But once we did, we're like, oh my goodness, there is depth in this. We better do more research. So we're going to work with 12 more organizations this year and try to decode as much as possible what the love language of fundraising is. And if 12 is not enough, you bet next year we'll be coming back and do another 12 until we exhaust all language in love in fundraising. So you can use it to grow giving and grow love in a science-based, evidence-based. So there. That's how you get a donor's attention. That's how you build trust. In the remaining few minutes that I have, I'm going to show you how to build donor loyalty, which basically means to help you people feel better about giving. And I need to warn you that this is the most 
academically dense portion of the presentation. And I'm going to show a lot of very complicated graphs with numbers on them. And before I show any of it, I want to reassure you that you do not need to read any of those numbers. All right. I have to show them to you because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. But I will tell you the story behind the numbers in less than six minutes. So how can we make people feel better? Well, in an early study we published in 2020 in the Journal of Marketing Research, we did a piece of research where we we have donors, uh, we have um, donors from the public radio station, donors from charity, um, human rights charity in Australia. We use these moral words. We measure them in the surveys and we use them in communications. We found they can make a real difference in real donors, in increased giving in these real world situations. And then we decided we're gonna do another study in the lab where we bring people into filling out really complicated surveys. Because if they do, then we can understand why they give more and how they give more and what the impact of giving more money is. And basically, no need to read any of the small print. What we found is that when people give money, when women in particular give money, they feel encouraged. They feel like they're reaching their moral ideals. They're being the kind of moral person that they want to be and they experience a lot less gap between who they actually are and who they ideally would like to be. So that gap between how actually kind and caring they are and how ideally kind and caring they are shrunk after women give money. And the less actual moral they think they are, the more their giving can help shrink that gap. And that's what this complicated graph is telling you, right? But then what we found is that, yeah, with all these numbers and graphs and everything that we need to satisfy academic reviewers, we actually have only found a way to help females give more. That's not very satisfactory, is it? We're ignoring half of the population. So we spent the last five years asking ourselves, okay, what about males? Five years later, 22 organizations data collection completed. We finally worked out <laughs> how we can help males to feel better in giving. And really what we found is what matters in a lot of these organizations where males and females give, it's not just about what they say about themselves as a person or what they say about themselves as a supporter is the degree to which these words overlap that matters. So people can say kind and caring and helpful as a person, kind and ca caring and helpful as a supporter. And when people use these words that's overlapping, they're called overlapping moral words versus there are non-moral overlapping words like loving, supportive, thoughtful, understanding, faithful, hopeful. Like those are positive words, but they're not moral. So when we calculate the percentage of words that overlaps, whether they are moral or non-moral between the person and the supporters, we found that in females, their moral words and their non-moral words overlap more than their male counterparts. What does that mean? It means giving as an action is inherently more integrated into a female sense of who they are. We didn't make it up. It's just like, that's how people are. Like if you ask people to say these things, that's what you will find. But how can we help males feel better? Well, it turns out that for males, 
if they are the kind of male who already think being kind and caring and compassionate are important, when they give money, they feel encouraged, they feel they can reach their moral ideals, and then giving become part of who they are, not just in the moral sense, like in males, in females, but actually in them, their sense of being a loving, supportive, thoughtful, understanding, faithful, and hopeful people. So for if you are a nonprofit organization, you choose what words to use. If you use words like caring, kind, and helpful, you can help your female donors feel better, and you can connect with your male donors for whom their moral identity is already important. But if you want to also connect with your male donors, you need to also use these words, loving, supportive, thoughtful, understanding, faithful, and hopeful. Because those are the traits that your male donors, especially those who are already moral themselves, who think morality is important, this is how they integrate into the charitable world. These are the traits that they rely on to make connections. And these are the ways that you can help your male donors feel better. We didn't know that until pretty much last month once we looked at this data from 22 organizations. So, so far, all our um, research users have been using moral words. In the next 24 months during this research um, of the new love language, we're gonna have um, experimental testing done for organizations to use these sets of words. And we're gonna track to see if there's any difference in male and female donors in their sustainable giving. So in a nutshell, those are the three things that we talked about. How do you get people's attention? Talk to their moral identity. How do you build trust, understand, how your organization can help them express, live, and reach their moral ideals of being a kind and caring and helpful person? And how can you um, grow your loyalty and grow your giving sustainably? Make sure that you can contribute to how kind, caring, helpful they can feel, and how loving, supportive, thoughtful, understanding, faithful, and hopeful they can feel. These words work for both male, so for females and males with who already think morality is important. And these words are specifically powerful for males. Any questions? You want to stop sharing, Jen, and I will um, share the QR codes for our students. I'll tee those up. And then... Yeah. Um, if people would like, they can put some questions in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand and I can also call on you. Um, so I know some of the questions as people are thinking about what they wanna ask. If you're a very small shop, um, what's the best way to gather information about your donors? Kind of like what you were saying is you need to know your donors. Is there better ways to do that or suggestions for that from, from your research? Yeah, um, uh, several um, examples that I shared with you, and I have a lot more examples um, from small charities. Often it's one person shop, and I'm not even saying one person uh, fundraiser is like one person direct director, and that's it, right? Everybody else is volunteer. Um, the recommendation we give them is first of all, caring, kind, and helpful and compassionate. You don't need to test, just use them. I mean, that's re why we have research, right? So you don't have to in every single situation just go ahead and use them and if you're a small shop don't even go surveys it takes too much money when you get the results you don't know how to use them so don't waste the time rely on what you can get from um, research that is already done and to be honest 
in our website alone, you can probably get like 150 tips of what to do. And if you just go through one of our research report and go down the, the list of what to do, you will have more than a year or two worth of tips to implement into your programs. So you really don't need to you know, do too much research. But for every interactions you do have with all of your donors, I would encourage you to very thoughtfully ask them questions, to ask them, you know, like what is most meaningful for them in the work that you do. So you can begin to translate what you do into the language that your donors use. Nope, those are great, those are great suggestions. Yeah. So let me bring up um, the participants and also check the chat. So what about, um, so Maureen wanted to know, do you get objections to some of this research from fundraisers who might be used to a certain style or you know, a certain way, more transactional maybe necessarily than using kind of the love language ideas? And, and what do you say to them? Yeah, absolutely all the time. That's why I love what I do. <laughs> if I can switch my mind over a burger, I would be happy, right? Okay, so usually the objections are, well, these are done and tested techniques that we use. We use it everywhere, it raise money fine. And usually if you ask them when you say, you raise money fine, what are the measures you use to raise money? Usually is immediate return on investment. And you tell them, well, that is the wrong thing to measure, <laughs> right? You can't measure fundraising success by campaign-based matrix. It's just not the best measure. You have to measure fundraising, um, success by lifetime value, how much donor will give to you over a lifetime, not how each technique work immediately after one campaign. So usually if I'm talking with fundraisers, nonprofit executives who understand the lifetime value calculation, you rarely hear any objections at all to this approach because they understand actually you are getting into the gold mine. Usually, if I do get objections, it's from people who don't calculate their fundraising success by lifetime value. Um, Mary, uh, let's see here. Oh, Maureen wanted to know, um, do you see difference, because you work in so many different countries, do you see difference in across cultures and nationalities with some of this work? And how does that play yeah. out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what doesn't change are the three words. <laughs> Everything else changes, right? <laughs> Not caring, compassionate is like everywhere in all organizations, you countries. Um, but everything else is not just a different culture differ, different um, organizations differ. You, you don't find any two organizations that are the same to each other in the composition of their database. I mean, that's why it's so fascinating. It's like, when I talked to nonprofits, I was like, you have no competitors at all whatsoever. <laughs> like other people might do similar things, but your people are your people. And everybody's group of people are different to other people's group of people. So if we take the time to understand how our people are uniquely ours, whether you're a large or small organization, you, you will be able to connect to them. Um, and yeah, I can, if, you, if you're interested in particular differences between like certain type of organizations or different continents, I can comment more on that. But in, in general, because of the culture differences, like, like the way that kind and caring compassion would be expressed in Spain is different from the UK is different from Norway, it's different from Canada, it's different from the US, it's different from Australia. But that is just language is different. Spanish sound different. <laughs> Italian sound different. Norwegian sound different. Like it's just not the same language system. But kind and caring and compassion as values is everywhere. Um, yeah. No, I think that's, that's great. Um, Jessica, because she's a former student and, and she's local, so I don't mind <laughs> putting her on the spot. Jessica, do you want to ask your question um, if you can on mute, and then we can get more of a dialogue? She's asking. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, 
So Jen, awesome presentation. Um, Dr. Shang, um, one of the things you shared was an example of like a fundraising appeal letter. And it just made me think of the, you know, timeless question of do donors actually read the full letter and no. is a traditional letter still a good approach to asking for money? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So it, like we teach this in our copywriting class. So basically, like if you are a traditional fundraising letter print, people read the F sign, right? They read the first line, a few words, the first line of the first paragraph, a few lines of the second pair, a few words of the second paragraph, and they skim. The most often read portion of the letter is the PS. <laughs> Make sure you write your PS well. I didn't right. know that, that that's what that's called, Jen. It's, a, it's an F. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's a sign. And then so so really like for your entire print letter, like in our copywriting class, we really only ask our students to pr practice very few places. You practice the Johnson box. That's the big, big print on the top of your letter. You practice the first line, which shouldn't be longer than seven words. You practice the, the first few words of your second paragraphs. You, you practice two or three bolded highlighted portion of your letters and the PS. Like if people skim that way, they need to know exactly why they give you money and then you need to be able to touch their heart. Um, and, and, and there's, there's a, you know, the equivalent of that for digital communications, like on website, there's the heat map on um, emails, there's, you know, how many words of subject line. It's, it's the same spill, but, but nobody reads letters page by page. Um, that's also why I was saying, you know, with the, if, if you sign up for you for you and you get their newsletter and you skim their big print um, headlines, you cannot read any headline without seeing the love between the donor and the refugee. And it's always equals. It's not like I'm handing down. It's like, oh, this is how they love each other. It's just beautifully done. And obviously, if you read their letter, the, their, the quality of their stories are also really high these days. But it's really the headlines that is the easiest to grab and run with. Jen, um, you, you touched on it, but what got you into this work? I mean, you did your PhD at Indiana University in, in philanthropy. Where does the link come into psychology? What was in your background that you saw that? Yeah, for the for the psych majors in the audience, I actually had three psychology degrees um, before I got into philanthropy. I was um, I was doing cognitive psychology and undergraduate, computationally co computational cognitive modeling in my first master, and judgment decision making in my second master. So I have like twenty staff courses in me before I even know philanthropy exists, right? So I was like overloaded with the social science of psychology, like overloaded with the methodology and theories of how to treat um, people and how people learn. And I got completely lost because I was like, I've got all these tools, no topic that speak to my heart. And when, um, when I was doing one of my degrees at um, Carnegie Mellon, I listened to public radio stations. <laughs> And as a poor uh, PhD student on scholarship, that's my one form of entertainment, classic music station on the local music station. And then one morning I woke up, man, it's the fun drive. I was like, they are killing me. They're taking like my one joy in life away by doing fun drives. And worse than that, like the message is, if you don't give money today, we're not going to be there tomorrow. You know, you really do need to give money today, like before five. And if you give like $100, there's the hat. If you give $150, there's the t-shirt. I was sitting there thinking, wait a moment. Okay, first of all, I know nothing about fundraising. And second of all, I have never given you money. And third of all, you have never died. So clearly you are lying to me, right? You are not going to go off air if I don't give money today. And then I sit there and think to myself, well, if I have been giving to this organization for a decade or two, they're still telling me if I don't give tomorrow, they're not going to say, oh. I mean, that's not very satisfying. And I got all self-righteous. I rang that radio station. I was like, I don't have any money. I'm like a poor, like international student. But I'm telling you, this fundraising approach does not work. 
And then the next morning I woke up and turned on to the same radio station. I have not heard that message again in the same station. And I was like, oh my goodness, fundraising is where I can make a difference in this world. I love it. You know, like, yeah, that's, um, <laughs> it's a place where you can make a difference to grow love. And it, it doesn't matter. Like I was, you know, like I was, I must be like a year or two after I get, came to the US. I had no, you know, social connections, no real understanding about the field. I just kind of used common sense to think about it and made a, made a call. And I've never left fundraising. It's just such a beauty. I mean, I met so many beautiful people in this profession. Smart, hardworking. It's just fundamentally good, kind people. It's just really nice to be in this field. You mentioned, you know, having kind of a long view of a donor relationship. You want that, not a campaign by campaign. Um, how does, how did, in your research, have you parsed out, you know, the shorter term campaigns give to our annual versus like larger, whether that's capital or endowment campaigns, does the messaging change at all or not really? It doesn't really matter for the type of campaign you're running. Just curious. Um, I'm trying to think about the best way to, to answer that question. Okay. If the starting point of the campaign is the heart of the donor, and it is about connecting to what they think is kind and caring and compassionate, then the, the fundraising message is very similar to each other. You know, we, we interview people who've got um, um, liquid at work, um, net worth of over 20 million and a uh, and some of them have um, such asset to approaching a billion. So they are like really ultra big donors, right? And when you ask them to tell stories of how they love and how they connect with one other individual in their philanthropic journey, those stories are exactly the same as donors who give 10, 10 pound a month, five pound a month for ages to the same organization. If you, if you, if you, if you hear the the, the stories they tell, the, the individual stories they tell, they're, they're all the same. Um, but organizations have structures, have disciplines, have differences, have approval process of what communication is allowed. That's what creates the silos when things don't sound the same. Um, am I going to say those things are definitely wrong? No, because every organization is on a journey. I think the best way for us to walk this journey with every organization that we encounter is to love them where they are. So they might not say the same thing to all donors at the moment, but, but, but look for what they do really well. Look for what they connect really well with which group of people and how, and then help them to replicate what they already are doing really well in more and more people groups and more and more channels and more and more types of communications. I think that will be the, the best way for us to create sustainable change. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions from our group today? We still have 76 people hanging in there. <laughs> You said you need to also share the QR code. Um, yes, I did. I shared it. Oh. And I put the links actually in the chat as well. So if you're here from business or honors, you can click on those links. They can also find me after. Um, so if, if you didn't get that, you can certainly reach out to me too. Just want to make sure okay. that I got. Oh, so there was one question. Mary had a question around, how do you classify words as moral and non-moral? Was there, um, and there's probably a much deeper and longer explanation, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, fundamentally, we worked uh, through two traditions in psychology. One is um, the, the moral identity um, concept defined by trades. And that is based on um, uh, two scholars, um, Carl Aquino and Americus Reed. One of them is in University of British Columbia. The other one is in University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School of Business. So these two scholars generated the original, um, the empirical research for the original nine moral trades that people use to 
to, to describe their moral identity. That paper was published in 2002, I think. So since then, the, during the 20 years since that original research was published, more identity has been studied, replicated by scholars around the world. So there are thousands of study now today studying more identity, but most of them are able to replicate the nine words structure. Um, so that's how we um, defined moral identity in our study. We were trying, you know, our best to to come up with other words. It's just not like our, our donors tend to stick with those. So we just went what they wanted us to go after. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. And you pointed people to your website so they they can find all these papers. So my plan yeah. is I'm going to upload this to our YouTube channel. Anyone who registered will get the link. And then I'll put in those links that you mentioned in your slides, uh, Jen. I'll put those in the email that you'll get from me either later today or first thing tomorrow. And then you'll get more resources from there. So I want to thank you so much. If everybody wants to clap away, <laughs> thank you so much for yeah. sharing your time so graciously, um, for sharing your knowledge and experience. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see all of you again on another program in the center. Thanks very much and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Yep, thank you.